Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Grow Big TV. We got a great live today. We're talking about pollinators. And hello, uh, <laughs> hello. hello. <laughs> so now I'm known to butcher names. Well, this was going to, if I get this one, this would be great. <laughs> so uh, we got Leah Continentino on today. And she went to school in Florida and uh, she studied uh, environmental. Uh, studies and ecology, and she's passionate about forest ecology and uh, uh, pollinator ecology. So this is going to be a great, great live. Um, a lot of people don't talk about pollinators, but it's it's you know bees and the butterflies and getting more uh, bounty harvests. You know what you're growing it's so important. So you know uh, uh, with pollinators. You know, it's been on a decline, so we're going to ask a lot of questions about that. So when people are coming on in, I'm going to show this Common Ground film, which is two minutes long before we have our guest on. So here is Common Ground. A new documentary is launching a movement to change our farming practices and restore our soil. I'm excited to share with you all common ground. This is the single most important story of our lifetime. Now we have the ability to literally stop climate change in its tracks within less than a generation. This film actually proposes a solution they could actually bring the entire planet to carbon neutral. This is a crazy concept. This is insane. Common ground needs to be seen in the White House. We couldn't not make a second film after Kiss the Ground. I mean, it was a runaway success. The film is a love letter to our children all about how we can save their future, but also make sure that the world is thriving for all future generations. We have to come together and find common ground for common good. How was the film received? Sold out screening. It's probably one of the most important films you can see this year. Go watch Common Ground best movie of the year. It is a movie of our time and the next generations to come. This movement is catching on like wildfire. What should I do next? Go see Colin Brown! Exciting times. So many great movies starting to come out um, about our soil and because uh, it's so important because the government is kind of shadow banning everything. They don't want you to know what's really going on. They want to be a little under control. So it's time. A lot of people went out of their way and started, hey, we're going to work on the soil due to do the right thing. And so... Uh, that's uh, so important. So let's see who's here in the chat before we welcome our guests. People are still rolling in. There's a lot of people on LinkedIn supposed to come on in the chat today, which is pretty cool. God's desire for me. Welcome in. There's Jay Dixon, Milk and Honey Heritage Farms, built on a rock homestead. Jajajajubi, Ordi Kelleher, welcome in. Rick Thane, Mike's Chaotic Gardening. Uh, CR is here, Creative Redundancy. Jennifer Ocean Homestead. Let's see who else. Serena is here. Welcome in, Serena. Jersey Twister, Corey Sutton. And a lot of people are still starting to roll in. So welcome in, guys. So if you guys notice, Corky is a little bit under a second delay. <laughs> so, and she's having a bad storm right now. So if something happens, she might go out and come back in. Just want to let you guys know that um, because, you know, it's crazy times out there, right? Okay. So um, we're going to welcome our guest, Leah Continentino. Welcome in. Welcome in. Okay. So how bad did I say your name? 
No, you said it perfect. No <laughs> way. <laughs> I'm proud of myself. <laughs> it's a Polish guy talking. You know, we're not good at st- <laughs> saying names if we're like Polish names, like Kozlowski or something. Yeah, those are the hardest ones. <laughs> I'm backwards, you know, <laughs> can I say? So when did you start um, getting interest in, interested in pollinators? Um, I think probably it was around 2020. Uh, back in college, I started gardening. I took an organic gardening course in college and um, started getting into that world. And then I started to focus on gardening less for food and gardening more for environmental support for pollinators. And um, when I got into that, it was just like a snowball. So I ended up um, teaching that for a semester in college, and that was a lot of fun. And then in that process, I kind of um, realized the potential for pollinator gardens. And, um, you know, if we all pitched in a little something, we could make a really big difference. So, yeah. So you can see Leah is an owner of the Pollinator Power Network. on It's right there on Facebook. Thank you, Jay, for posting that. And it's also under the description. Welcome in, Laura. Welcome in, Bella. Good to see you guys. Um, now, did you have a garden growing up, or did you just went to the store and that was it? I had a garden growing up. I mean, it wasn't like crazy elaborate, but it was enough to have that connection to nature. And, um, you know, at an early age, I, I gardened like my annual tulips that I always did and things like that. But I didn't really get into the organic gardening and like um, planning out my own gardens and, you know, getting really into it until college, really. So you're you, more- Well, where did you grow up? What uh, state? I actually grew up in New Jersey until I was 12. And then I moved oh. to Florida. Okay, okay, now I'm a Jersey guy. <laughs> we're in Jersey. I was Where'd in you- Maplewood. In Maplewood, okay. That's all yeah. the way up north. Yeah, I live in I live south of Rutgers. Okay, gotcha. So yeah, I love it. It was really nice. <laughs> um, Jersey Twister, we did get that by the way, just to answer that question. Um, I can't believe we, I didn't know you were from Jersey. That's great. That was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> all over the place. Uh, now, did you? Uh, was it just flowers or did you grow vegetables too? We grew mainly flowers um, when I was little, but yeah. And we got more into vegetables um, in college, really. I did the organic stuff. And then I, I got more into um, ecology and how you can, you know, do something to um, better your ecosystem. And then that was like, that's it. <laughs> I remember my first flower I took pride in was just plain marigolds. Yeah. Flowers. Because on my grandmother, I seen, not my, this is my, yeah, my grandmother. So she put uh, always marigolds in this one section. And I used to, well, I was told very little, go water it. So I would go water the marigolds, you know, power, mm-hmm. spray it, like really hard. Stop spraying it so hard, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's what kids do, you know. And then um, I seen if things dying. I'm like, I remember asking a question. What are those things over there? Why are they dying? Why can't we get them back to grow again, you know? She goes, oh, just pull them off. There's seeds in there. And so at a very young age, I learned how to save marigold seeds. Oh, that's awesome. And yeah. so I, I couldn't wait to plant them the next year. Because I was like, oh, this is cool. Let me see if it works. Nobody yeah. told me. I got all muddy doing things. Like, what are you doing out there? <laughs> you know, I couldn't wait to plant marigold seeds. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, that's awesome. I was that kid that ate dirt. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. Corky, what was the first thing you saved for seeds? Do you remember? I don't remember. Um, I saved for seeds. I'm trying to really think. Out of our garden, um, 
I think it's the easiest to save like the marigolds and stuff like that. I think, oh, you know what? My first one was the Mexican sunflowers. I think that I started saving those and those are really easy because, and then I started saving things like hollyhocks and, um, and then the marigolds and stuff like that. But I think my first one was the Mexican sunflowers because they're just so easy to put in a bag and, and zinnias. Zinnias are another one. So after college, you went to Brazil. I did, yeah. <laughs> and so tell us a little bit about Brazil. Um, well, I was in the Atlantic rainforest area, which is uh, the mm -hmm. second most biodiverse rainforest. And so it was awesome just to be surrounded by that. Um, and that's really, you know, that and family. But that was also a big reason for me going down there. So I wanted to, um, I was kind of in between pollinators and forest ecology. And so I did some work with mangroves down there. Um, but I really want to do, you know, connect with people and teach something that will kind of empower others to make a difference. So that's kind of why I'm focusing in on pollinators now. Yeah. My favorite pollinators are the ones that first come out in the spring. I love the mason bees. Oh yeah. And um I have I have a lot of mason bee houses and all that kind of stuff. But the one thing that they love to do is I have these old wrought iron um like handles that have mm -hmm. like a hole in it. And every year they come back to that and they love it. And I'm like just let them do their thing. And just let, so every year they just like are all over it. Now just let them do their thing. Cause I love Mason bees. They're so cute and fuzzy. <laughs> I've seen them do that in metal wind chimes and it makes the funniest noise. <laughs> <laughs> they're so goofy, but I love them. And I love that they're like the first ones out and they love to poll. I love when they pollinate my apple trees and all of that in the, in the spring. And um, they're just super cool. Yeah. They're super cute. And a lot of people forget about them because they think, you know, honeybees are um, the main pollinator and, you yeah, know, but a lot of people forget about the little guys, the little mason bees. Thing. You know, the whole save the bees movement. And I feel like there's so many people who care, um, which is awesome. And then we're all like, we're a little too focused on the honeybees, right? So there's a lot of interest out there and I want to kind of, turn that interest over to the native bees because honeybees are invasive. You know, they're, they're great, but they're not meant to be here. So we could really use some, um, some support for our native pollinators, our native bees. Now, what about, what about carpenter bees? Everybody hates them, but they also pollinate too, don't they? Right. Yeah. Um, well, you could give them a designated, um, log or something like that to give them their habitat and um hopefully that's enough to kind of uh keep them away from your house and you know if you give them something that's easier than um digging into your treated wood then they probably will focus more on that so like if you drill some holes in a log get the holes started for them um, things like that same with mason bees a lot of the solitary bees um that nest in holes, that nest in pre-existing holes, like from beetle larva and things like that. So um, it's important to, you know, if you want to put a log out for the bees, also stick some holes in there, get some holes in there so that they have something to work with. Um, it's really cool to see the mason bees mud over their their little thing. Like they're just so cool. I they're one of like I said, you guys, you need to get mason bee houses <laughs> or make your own and watch them because they're so cool and i love to watch them mud over their little hole um for the next year and yes yeah, so then you got to protect them make sure that the woodpeckers don't come down and eat them out of there or wasps or whatever but they're just so cool and they're like the coolest bees they, i mean i don't think they're necessarily gonna sting you but um no, yeah so they're, they're not gonna like come after you they're just like the puppy dogs of the of the pollinator world they're really cool and um yeah the native bees are really 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 important and um yeah i love honeybees and all but it's you it's unbelievable what those little native bees can do 
um, okay. especially on a farm where I have like apple trees and all of that, um, how much they can pollinate. Yeah, and the the ones that are you know built for specific plants, you gotta have the really tiny ones and the super fluffy ones, and you know the whole shebang, the whole variety. I mean, if you've got like blueberries or tomatoes, you're gonna want something that'll buzz pollinate, right? Rather than a honey, a honeybee isn't gonna be able to pollinate your squash, your tomatoes, um, things like that. You're gonna want to support your bumblebees and mason bees and things that have a little more buzz. Now there are several first pollinators that come out right at springtime, mason bees. And then how long does a mason bee live for until they're done? Um, it well, typically lives like a couple weeks, but it really depends on the species. Um, yeah, the, I mean, all kinds of pollinators have different life cycles and, um, and so, yeah, that's uh, getting more specific. Some of them overlap. Some of them last or are around for a long time. Some of them are around for just a few days, you know. Oh, okay. And then the leaf cutters usually come out. And then, then you'll end up seeing a lot of the bigger uh, bees. I, I know I saw a bumble. Well, I don't even think it was a bumblebee. I think it was a carpenter bee. Um, or smacked right into my mom's window. <laughs> looking outside. I'm like, man, you must have thought he could. My mom is really particular about cleaning her windows. So it must have really thought it could fly through. <laughs> but yeah, I thought that was kind of funny. I'm like, well, bees are out already. We're seeing them. I just haven't seen the uh, ugly ones, the wasps and the the other. Yeah, <laughs> but the wasps have their place too, you know. Um, and they sometimes they'll pollinate. You know, paper wasps do pollinate, and a couple other. There are quite a few species that pollinate, but the others will keep you know other pests or things and check in your garden. So they play a really important role too. The only real difference between a wasp and a bee is a bee is vegetarian and a wasp is not. So they're, they all come from the same line, um, the same descendants. And then at some point, bees discovered pollen and started using that as their protein source. And wasps continued with insects and soft-bodied insects and caterpillars, things like that. So that's probably the same as yellow jackets as well. And I noticed that one year I had yellow jackets like all over my raspberry bushes just eating them. Yeah, the raspberries. And I was so mad. <laughs> Nothing I could do about it. Um, so that that's probably the same for them as well. They're more they will just eat and um, not pollinate as much. Yeah, um, it really depends on the species. But you know, some of them just pollinate accidentally by um, going to the plant for other rewards. But some of them will actually collect pollen like a bee and take it back to their nest and utilize it. Um, it's a lot less than, you know, a bee would, but it's <laughs> is, it, is it true that male bees don't sting? It is and true. Male bees sting. How are about gonna, that? Are you going <laughs> to take the risk out there in the garden and figure out which one's male and which one's female though, Joe? Hey, dude, you're a good guy. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't <Yeah>. like me. <laughs> Get away from her. The funny thing is, though, that especially with wasps, the males are the ones that are overcompensating. So if, if you see like a really aggressive wasp, chances are it's a male that really wants you to think it can sting. But oh. um, and the females are usually too busy doing their thing that they like don't even want to sting you because <laughs> it's funny. Um, the bees and wasps, all of the order Hymenoptera, the the stinger is actually a modified version of their egg laying um, part, their ovipositor. So since a male doesn't lay eggs, the males don't sting. Um, but the, the females also build the nests, dig the holes, collect the pollen, or as when uh, female wasps, they hunt the prey for the larva. So they do like basically everything. And the males just kind of um, reproduce. <laughs> Now, for the first time, I have seen these bees um, in my uh, orchard, and it was last year. I had European hornets. Oh, really? Um, for the first time, and that I that I have noticed, 
And those suckers are huge. They scared the crap out of me. Um, and they're weird looking. Mm -hmm. um, and I learned actually quite a bit about them. I didn't know that they were nocturnal. Oh, wow. Um, so I'm like, oh, that's terrifying. So if I'm outside, I could still, you know, usually think of a bee uh, falling asleep at night. Not these ones. Nope. Nope. <laughs> you go outside, you can still get stung in the middle of the night. And they're humongous. Yeah. <laughs> Photos. But I think I'm thinking of the Asian one. Oh, um, yeah. Invasive mm -hmm. around. Um, I think it's gotten into Florida now. Yeah. Oh, no. But they're like massive, wild. Yeah, that's horrible. So have I, you I, ever been stung? Have I ever been stung? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, have you been badly stung? Um, I think the worst was just a wasp sting, but it wasn't like anything crazy. Um, well, actually, there was one wasp in Brazil that got caught in my shirt. And so it stung me like six times in a row. And that was pretty rough. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, but bees, I've really only been stung when I accidentally bumped into them, like in the garden or um, I stepped on one. And then I was like, you know what, my bad. <laughs> I did that. I was visiting family in Michigan and I got, I actually had nine stingers in me. And oh. my cousins, they're looking at me because I don't know if I was in front or behind. And they see me going like, they, why is Cho dancing? <laughs> And I was like, I don't know what I was doing. <laughs> I was swatting, whatever, probably jogging in place, moving. I don't know. And they were like, wow, we were, after I ran to the house, their house, they were like, yeah, we were wondering what we were doing because you were looking like you were dancing and grooving and you started running. <laughs> I was just kind of getting stung. My wife is uh, allergic to honeybees mm. and, uh, and tomatoes. So uh, I grew like 300 tomatoes one year. <laughs> anyway, that doesn't matter. <laughs> I was just trying to be funny. Um, I uh, So if you get stung, what are you told to do? Oh, gosh. Um, I haven't actually done anything. But so, yeah, I don't know. Do you all know? <laughs> I Well, for me, it was put mud on it. That's the first okay. thing that you put mud. And so I was just wondering, hey, you know, you're by bees and pollinators or good guys and bad guys. Well, not really bad guys, but yeah, what do you do under, under our circumstance? Yeah, I'm not super allergic and I've been stung just a few times. So I really like when I have been stung, I've just kind of let it pass on its own. It takes a couple of days and it goes away. But I mean, that's, where, that's where it's good to know um, which bees leave a stinger and which ones don't. So if you're stung by a honeybee or something like that, then you definitely want to be looking for the stinger, I guess, right away. And then wasps are just horrible and they can just keep coming back for more. <laughs> <laughs> the only times I've been stung by wasp, it's been on my back. <laughs> so I'm yeah. like, that's just not nice. <laughs> I can't even imagine if it got inside your clothes and somewhere. You're just taking stuff off because you don't really care if anybody else is around. You're just throwing everything out. <laughs> then you realize. You're just trying oh. to get it away from you. Yeah. Yeah, you do the same little dance. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're planting in your garden, what are the top, I guess we'll just say the top five plants that you want to plant in your garden that will attract pollinators? All right. Well, so in my experience in Florida, um, I've done lots of salvias um, and asters, um, like goldenrod, echinacea, um, blazing stars are good. Um, but really, like any native flower is going to attract someone. So it's like there's no real way to mess it up you know um as long as you're sticking with native plants and um and uh that's that's really like the number one rule native plants and stay away from cultivars that are too um modified like double flowers usually are really hard for um pollinators to find the pollen source or things that have like very different colors from the original 
uh, variety. So as long as you can um, plant native and try to stick as much as you can to like the, the original um, native variety of plants, then you'll attract someone, you're gonna benefit someone <laughs> and um, you're gonna provide um, benefits to your ecosystem. So it's easy, it's, it's simple. I was told that to attract pollinators, you can also take a sugar water and spray that on the flowers as well. I've never done it because I was always afraid that I would attract other things like ants. Yeah, I personally wouldn't do it. I mean, I'm not sure. I haven't seen um, very much on that, but just thinking about it, it sounds like it could be confusing. Um, so, you know, if they're looking for a nectar source, especially like pollinators that can taste with their feet, you know, if they land, then they're going to feel that they're going to taste that sugar water. And that could get confusing um, if they're using that taste receptor to try to find the nectar source of a flower. Okay. You know, say they're on a leaf and they're looking for pollen and then that's confusing. Um, but I think, you know, keep it... Um, Keep it natural and, and that's the best way to support them because um, if you want to support them with some kind of like water, that's totally um, recommended. And then I would make a puddling area, um, which is just a shallow dish or literally just make a puddle. Um, you're mimicking a puddle. So you're going to want some dirt in there, some rocks. Rocks are good so that they can land on something and not drown. Um, and the dirt is good because it'll provide minerals. Um, if you want to throw a little bit of salt in there, that's good for them. Or if you want to uh, cut a piece of fruit and like leave a slice of apple or a slice of orange, that's also good. Um, yeah. Okay. So what are some of the other perennials you like? If you had a garden, what are some of your favorite uh, perennials you like to eat, grow? Um, so perennials, I... I grew um, a lot of necklace pod and um, not necessarily perennials, but any annual that'll reseed itself is really nice. Um, lots of native plants reseed really easily. And then that's why we consider them weeds. Um, but really that if you want something that shows up every year um, and it reseeds, then that's awesome. Um, but yeah, there's lots of shrubs too and trees that are good for pollinators. So like oak trees host more caterpillar species than any other species. Um, oh. And that's like, you know, something that'll last you forever, just do it once. Um, and shrubs like um, bushes, like down here in Florida, fire bush is awesome. Um, and then like, Vining perennials. I love um, coral honeysuckle. Um, I would stay away from trumpet vine. I've seen um, a couple people uh, mentioning trumpet vine as a pollinator plant for hummingbirds. It does attract hummingbirds. It is native, but it is so hard to weed out of your garden once you've got it in there. I have that, and it was like a full time thing. It's very invasive. <laughs> yeah. um, and then coral honeysuckle does an awesome job and it's like super similar, uh, but it doesn't go everywhere, go crazy. Um, yeah, off the top of my head, uh, like ironweed is really good. Um, yeah, lantanas, native lantanas are really good. Okay. So we, I, I've been giving out a lot of seeds and stuff like that. So I've been using a lot of flowers, such as bee balm, hollyhocks, mm -hmm. hyssop, mint, uh, fox, lupin, lavender, butterfly weed, black eyed Susan. I've oh, been giving awesome. those out for the last couple of months, which is pretty awesome. Yeah. Um, um, so for the people here, you know what? Uh, if you look at the environment, everything wants, everybody wants to get away from bees. Have you noticed that too? I mean, not in my bubble. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But have you noticed the general public like, like, hey, let's get away from bees. Let's grow plants a different way so we don't have to worry about getting stung anymore. That's what seems to be yeah. a big thing outside of gardening. It's a lot of work though, you know? 
and they do that work for free. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, I can't imagine um, somebody actually saying that. Is that a real thing? That is a real thing. <laughs> That's the closer you go to cities, yeah. especially, which is insane. Especially you know? like um, in areas where where agriculture depends on bees to be shipped in and things like that, where it's um, costly. And then you know, if you were to focus a little on the um, on you know building hedge crops or things like that to boost native pollinator populations, then they will come to you for free. Um, and building habitat that you know they want them you want them to be residents and not just visitors. So you want to build not only nectar sources but habitat really for them to nest and for them to to reproduce and be there and be you know, established, but it's not just bees too. So that's also a big thing. We think of pollinators, we think of bees and butterflies, but you know, beetles are super important. Moths are super important. Um, even ants pollinate sometimes and, um, and in different places, you know, like down here, we have a lot of hummingbirds. We actually have in Florida, South Florida, we have a non-migratory population of hummingbirds so oh okay year year round um but you know the whole north america's got hummingbirds depending on the right time of year you'll have them um but yeah so it's just all shapes and sizes right so we think about such a small box um when we think of the pollinators and normally you know if you see a beetle in your garden you might not think that it's doing much but they do actually pollinate quite a bit. And they're actually the first, um, as far as we know from like archeological sources, they're the first documented pollinators to evolve. So that's interesting. Wow. I didn't know that. Yeah, and they have like crazy ancient relationships with other really, really old plants like magnolias and um, pawpaws are pollinated by beetles. Um, wow, I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. That's crazy. I, I just planted a bunch of pawpaws so, yeah. uh, a year ago. So, yeah, that's exciting. I didn't know that. And I think pawpaws, I feel like I saw something recently with hand pollination. And I thought, you know, maybe that's a plant that people are struggling to see it get pollinated. Um, so, yeah, beetles are important. And, and a good way to support your beetles is the soil. Right. So you guys talk about soil a lot um, and a lot of beetles will spend their larval stage in the soil and have like a really big difference between their larval larval stage and their adult stage. So sometimes they're totally carnivorous during their larval stage and then just eat pollen during their adult stage. Um, and then, you know, they need totally different environments. Um, and so they'll overwinter in, in the ground. So tilling and things like that will harm beetle populations. Um, so you want to like leave some leaf piles and and things like that to to accommodate them. And I saw my very first ladybug today. Awesome. Very strange and it was very fat and big. I was surprised. <laughs> um, so I put it in my, I have like a cold frame. So I hurried up and put it in there. I said, you can have fun in my lettuce. <laughs> and then um, another thing is I haven't had them yet, but they're horrible. Our cucumber bugs, but are cucumber bugs also pollinators? Um, because they're a beetle. Familiar with those? Do you know the species? I can do a quick search. But I'm not familiar with because I mean they're horrible. I hate them. They're they totally eat my plants. They decimate them. But are they? If they're also a pollinator. There are some overlaps. <laughs> like a catch-22. Yeah, there are some overlaps um, with beetles that we consider pests and beetles that are pollinators. And then that all kind of goes into the, you know, who are you gardening for? Are you gardening for your food? Or are you gardening for your wildlife? And so then you've got, you know, some um, give and take there where, um, you know, you don't want to put pesticides out there, but at the same time, um, you know, maybe you plant more cucumbers and you expect a chunk to go to the beetles. <laughs> and so just overplant. That's always been yeah. my motto anyway, is I yeah. overplant because if I didn't 
I wouldn't have any peas right now because my turkey would have eaten them all. <laughs> so, yeah, so that is, so just overplant and just expect a portion of it to go to the bugs. Yeah. So then it's not a loss. It's just expected. <laughs> so how do bees communicate with each other? Oh, gosh. Well, that's dependent on the bee, I guess, because also not uh, the majority of bees in the in North America are not social. Um, but, you know, the honeybees have that whole famous waggle dance thing. Um, but, you know, lots of um, chemical communication. And then they, you know, they do a whole gesture thing that works. Um, <laughs> but I'm all about the dancing. <laughs> But 90% of North American bees are solitary. So there's not um, too much communication in those groups um, other than, you know, communication for reproduction. And that can be really interesting too with um, more specialist bees versus a, a generalist bee. Um, if you've ever seen like a male bee that just sits on a flower all day, um, that's a male bee that's waiting for the specialist female to go visit that flower because he knows that's like the meeting point you know if he can find that flower then he'll find a lady <laughs> that is funny because i've seen that with bumblebees a yeah. lot and i i've always wondered i'm like are they just being lazy or are they just taking a rest no they're just waiting for that times <laughs> just waiting for their love to come <laughs> bumblebees are the cutest <laughs> they are <laughs> So romantic. <laughs> <laughs> what are uh, colony collapse disorder? What? How does that factor in with that? Well, colony collapse disorder is humming or not hummingbird. What am I saying? Honeybee specific. Um, and so I, I've learned about it. I can't tell you a whole lot about colony collapse disorder because I personally. Don't go into the the honeybee literature that much, but that is a huge focus in like the scientific community for working on different diseases and things that affect the honeybees. Um, but yeah, personally, I I just I don't focus much on honeybees, so I don't, I'm not a, uh, super well versed in the colony collapse disorder. How what do is? Oh, go ahead, Joe. Yeah, okay, Sorry. I'll go ahead. I'll, I'll just... take it. Go ahead. <laughs> I'll jump on in. Okay. I just I'm getting all energized now. <laughs> <laughs> I got my second win for the day. Uh, how do pollinators affect the quality and yield of crops? Yeah, um, pollinator populations are really important to crop yields, um, and not just any pollinator populations, but like diverse pollinator populations, um, because not everyone is going to pollinate everything, right? or do it as well. So maybe they, they pollinate a lot of things, but there's one pollinator that'll do a really efficient job. Um, and so, you know, there've been studies, I can't tell you any specific numbers, but um, there've been studies in agricultural areas where they've done um, hedge crops and things like that to, to boost pollinator populations. And then they've noticed significant results with, um, with their um, why am I forgetting the word? Um, oh my gosh, what is the word that I'm looking for right now? Their crop, you just said it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Their crop yields, yields. Okay. Okay. Right. Right. Yes. They have like significant increases in their yields and also like larger fruit, um, things like that. Yeah. So I'm, um, most of those studies are done on an agricultural scale and not on personal gardens, but one would imagine that in your garden, it would be the same thing. And so what are uh, some of the most significant uh, threats to pollinators today? Oh, lots. Um, yeah, so the, one of the biggest threats is habitat loss. Um, that's an ongoing threat, and that's kind of, what I aim to tackle um, is to teach people how to create habitat because um, I think it's an area of land about the size of Minnesota that's taken up by American lawns. And 
you know, pollinators lose so much habitat to human development every year. And if we can just do a little bit in those lawns, then it'll uh, make a huge impact for them. But um, other than habitat loss, um, pesticide use is another big one. Um, not just where the pesticides are used, but, you know, runoff and um, uh, permeating into the soil and things like that. It really spreads to more than just um, areas where pesticides are used. Yeah, it's not just the bees. It's the beetles and everything else that are in the ground as well. Yeah. And now, you know, in streams and rivers and things like that, there's trace amounts of pesticides being found. So it's really um, spreading around. Um, and then um, pesticide use, habitat loss, climate change is another one. Um, just where their uh, habitats are changing, right? So changing temperatures can lead to um, passing a threshold that they can tolerate. And then unfortunately they either have to kind of migrate to new habitat that has the right temperatures for them, or if they can't adapt quickly enough, then, um, then they end up struggling. But, you know, that's one of the ones that's a little, um, I'm not going to say out of our hands, but out of, um, it's not easy to change, right? And so what I want to focus on um, in like the message that I want to give out to people is the, the habitat loss and pesticide use threats that we can really make an, a change in our, in our areas, our homes, or, you know, if you've got connections in your city or things like that, you can, um, make a really big difference just by focusing on those things. Well, glyphosate is great. It's, oh my God. We are, I'm so sick of glyphosate. <laughs> we had the glyphosate fact finder. Um, and she was absolutely amazing. And, uh, and just, oh my God, glyphosate, pesticides, does government, nobody cares. We just want to grow and we'll fix everything later. Yeah. That's what, that Something we petitioned for a lot at my college um, was to reduce the use. I mean, stopping entirely was essentially out of the question in all the meetings that we went to and we tried our best, but we were able to get them to reduce the use um, because what we found was that it was being used before any need even became apparent, you know? So um, it was like a baseline, just apply the pesticide. Mm -hmm. And um, before anything, any weeds were even visible or things like that, or um, insect pests. And like these weird rules that we had, like where a ring of pesticides had to be um, sprayed around the base of every tree and you could see it, like this dead zone. And the idea was to reduce competition so that the, the tree would do better. And we had to find all this research on how, um, you know, plants, they're not just purely competitive. There's a lot more going on um, and a lot of beneficial relationships. And so little by little, <laughs> things, differences can be made, but it is, um, it's tough to make those like more um, bureaucratic impacts. And so that's why I really want to empower people to make changes at home because, you know, that's where we have, control <laughs> that's where we have control and so we're talking about lettuce and quirky it's like why would you want to get any kind of either lettuce or brassicas in a store they're all full of crap yeah Total that's, crap. that's a lot of the main reason why i don't buy i don't buy lettuce from the store and i don't get it out anywhere unless i grow it myself because mainly because i don't want to die because yeah. there's just so many people uh, dying just from romaine lettuce. Like they get it in the store and it's not washed or there's something going on with it. And there's been, I uh, know one year specifically, there was a huge recall on all the romaine lettuce. And it's like, I worked at a restaurant that year actually. <laughs> in salads. And I remember that recall. Yeah. Yeah. It's horrible. And it's like, I might as well just grow it myself. 
lettuce is super easy even to grow inside. So just grow it yourself and make your own salads. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So I have two quick questions too, and they're both on Brazil. Uh, when you were in Brazil, was the Olympics that year? Um, no, not while I was there. I moved down there um, two years ago. And um, what's a, what do you see as a difference between uh, Brazil and the U.S. with growing their own uh, plants, any kind of plants? Um, well, Brazil and the U.S., Brazil is one of the leaders in pesticide use in agriculture. So I was, yeah, so I was really um, hesitant to buy anything that wasn't organic at the store. And it is so much less accessible the, to buy organic things. Um, but luckily I was able to find a small farm, like. That's uh, really fast. interesting and really surprising because they're also the main leader in beef for mm -hmm. our country as well. So the beef, they're also eating those pesticides. Yeah, and I am vegetarian <laughs> for environmental reasons. Well, um, I, can, I can understand why. I mean, when you hear yeah. that, it's like, I yeah, I can. I, that's scary. Yeah, uh, that's. I mean, I only buy local. I only buy local beef. I go to I go to a specific place where literally they have the cows outside when you drive in. So I know what I'm getting. I know that it's humane. I know what they're doing. But most yeah. people just go to Walmart. I mean, it's it's really tough that we have to, you know, like look into that stuff so, so much and really like investigate our food sources. Yeah. And it's, there's a huge disconnect now between consumers and food production. And so, I mean, that is something that, I think is wild and like if you don't know where it's coming from how are you eating it but it's something that's so normal now that i mean it, i understand too that that that's just how it is for most yeah. people yeah but um i was able to find like a um subscription organic basket and that was awesome because it was like a um, basket that was compiled from with produce and things from various different small farms. And um, and that was like more common than I've seen in the US. So it, it was kind of like this dichotomy, like either super industrial, lots of pesticides, or you find like this little um, niche kind of organic market, but that is more available like than I've, found here so hmm. yeah so serena asked a question what natural sprays are bad for pollinators and when can you use them without hurting pollinators good question yeah so natural sprays um so one thing to look into is just like um well by natural sprays, is that like neem oil and things like that? Or is that like the labeled non-lethal kind of things? Because there are plenty of non-lethal sprays and things like that, that while they aren't lethal, they are, um, they'll like severely impact, you know, their ability to find nectar or to do basic tasks that um, are necessary for survival. And so despite not being um, like directly lethal, oftentimes they'll lead to a, um, a, de a decrease in populations. But things like um, neem and things like that are, you know, they're um, still going to deter certain pollinators, right? But they're not, um, you know, that harmful compared to the, the other ones. And then if you're thinking like when to apply things, um, a lot of people say to do it at night or like not during active hours. Mm -hmm. I find that um, a little bit difficult because a lot of pollinators are nocturnal too. So like 
the moths are a huge player, just like the butterflies, but we just don't think of them as much because we're not really seeing them. Um, so then we, you know, if you're avoiding the active hours of a butterfly, you're probably going to get the active hours of something else. So it's, it's tough to say, um, but something that is good to look into is um, integrated pest management, right? So bringing in other, um, uh, benefiting other organisms that will help you to um, balance out your ecosystem. So that you, like, if you've got a lot of aphids or got a lot of caterpillars, maybe support your, sounds crazy, but support your wasps <laughs> and support your beetles. Um, bring in some ladybugs, things like that. But the thing with ladybugs is um, they can't really be captively bred well. So when you're bringing in ladybugs, be careful about where you're buying them because oftentimes they're um, just taken, they're like collected somewhere and then sold. Um, and so you're kind of, you know, removing them from another area. So it's not the most ecologically friendly, but. Well, how do you keep ladybugs in the garden? Um, same as most beetles. Um, so you want to have uh, a good soil, like hummus layer. That's where they're gonna overwinter, lay their eggs, things like that. And then, you know, a supply of aphids, you know, a supply of food for them. And that's-, that's Well, aphids why. always make their way to the garden sooner or later. <laughs> Or inside your house, <laughs> inside you when you start your seeds. Um, not too often here, thank God. <laughs> Don't water on top, water on a tray. <laughs> That's what I'm going to say. Question. I have not tried that. I don't know about the garlic. Um, but what is the garlic intended to um, reduce? Bugs. All different kinds of bugs. Like I spray garlic as well to keep the bug population down and um, keep but them so eating their plants. Or is that um, like beetles or? Um, for me, it's, yeah, it's um, actually, it's, yeah, beetles, I guess you would say. Um, stink bugs, um, squash bugs, those are the worst. Mm -hmm. And that's why I spray. And I always have to continuously do it. It's not something that just works overnight. I have to start it right from the beginning and um, keep it on there. Yeah, well, that's a good sign because it's not lingering too much. Yeah, it's is, but it's a good sign. <laughs> garlic is supposed to help with mosquitoes, too. Oh, interesting. Mosquitoes are also pollinators. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's the worst. <laughs> So I'm going to, I'm going to show everybody to one of your, your website you were on and uh, hold on one second. Hold on one second, guys. This is iNaturalist. Now this is really cool, guys. You guys are going to love this because when I first clicked on this, I thought it was one of those first sites that you just went on it. You started inputting stuff and that was it. Then I realized this level to the left, the observations, species, identifications, that's yeah. some good stuff there. Have you all been on iNaturalist before? I haven't. This is a first time for me. Fun. You've got to get on there. <laughs> iNaturalist is really cool because it actually connects you to the scientific community. So um, the, the deal with iNaturalist is you're doing more than just observing and identifying things um, because there's lots of people on there that will go in and um, confirm or they'll alter your identification. So it'll help you. You're not necessarily always going to identify something to the species level your first um, time posting it. But then, you know, a couple hours later, or maybe the next day, someone will come in and it'll be like, I don't know, you're looking at um, a bug and then an entomologist will come in and look at it and say, hey, this is this bug. Um, and then once three people confirm the same species, your observation becomes research grade. So scientists will go into iNaturalist and use those research grade observations because they've been um, kind of peer reviewed in a way. And then they get the location data and the you know data from the observation of you know what time of year, 
um, where it was and what it is. And they can use that for monitoring populations. So it's like, you know, all those apps that you use to identify plants and bugs, mm -hmm. you can do anything. Like you can put just audio of bird calls in there, um, all sorts of stuff. But with the additional piece where you're like contributing to citizen science. And then there's also this whole community piece where you can um, create projects or participate in projects. So if you go onto the projects page on iNaturalist, it'll have, um, based on your location, it'll have all the different projects that are available. And you might be able to see like what I'm a part of, I don't know. Um, but like, for example, maybe there's someone who's got a project that's just New Jersey pollinators. And then you can hit join and all of your observations that are made in New Jersey of pollinators will automatically be added to that project. So then, oh, cool. um, yeah, they have like seasonal like monarch watch or things like that that you can participate in. And you get this whole little community aspect, which is really cool. I think it's awesome. <laughs> so on this page, is this a, a picture of you right here? Yeah, that's me doing research. <laughs> now check up, check this guys out. I'm gonna put uh, observations. I'm gonna click on it. Now this is some pretty cool stuff. Power orchard. What is that? Um, I think that was in Madagascar. <laughs> that oh, cool. Um, some orchid. I was like trying to take a picture of every single orchid I could find because they have so many endemic species and um, cool things. And I was visiting there last summer. Um, and so there's a lot of orchids in there. Um, but I've been less active recently. I really need to get more observations up there. <laughs> I mean, if you think that I have a lot, you should see some people on iNaturalist. <laughs> thousands and thousands of observations. The cotton stainer bug. Look at that one. I mean, you know what's this is great about having like a camera <laughs> or your phone in the garden. When yeah. you're like, what is that? I've never seen that before. <laughs> You'll really use up your memory quickly. I <laughs> <laughs> my phone is just full of this. <laughs> wow. Let's see what else. Look, you got cramp balls. <laughs> <laughs> Let's click on cramp balls. <laughs> Where was that? That's Madagascar. Okay. I was trying to do a lot of mushrooms there too. Lots of fungi. I really like taking photos of mushrooms. I don't know much about them, but I think they're super cool to photograph. I do, too. I do that too. Um, especially if I'm in the woods or something, I see something really weird. Yeah. Like I want to take a picture of that. I had this one where I took a picture and it looked like there was a hole in the tree and they had like these bright orangey looking weird mushrooms next to it. I'm like, oh my gosh, it looks like a fairy house or something. It was so cool looking. I had to take a picture of it. Very cool. Also in New Jersey, where are you? I'm not in New Jersey. I'm in Ohio. I'm in Northeast yeah. Ohio. Okay. Very cool. I've never been. Yeah, well, I mean, there's not a whole lot here, but as far as species wise, there's probably some cool things to look at. So <laughs> you should come up sometime. Northeast. What yeah, is this? Yeah, I'm a I am an hour south of Cleveland. So okay. Oh, this is a really cool one too, right here. Not lumpy over here to the left. This one I can't pronounce. Yeah, I I can't remember what that was. It was like the base of a tree. And I want to say it was some reproductive thing of the tree, but it was like, looked like it was growing out of the ground, but it was actually part of the tree. Super wild. It looks like, um, have you guys ever seen bear corn? No. Mm -mm. Have you corn? Northeast. I never heard of it. No. If you're ever hiking and it looks like there's corn, like an old cob of corn on the ground, it's, it's like this plant. Um, I think it's a plant, not a mushroom. I think it's a parasitic plant that grows on the roots of, I can't remember what trees, but in Kentucky, there is a lot of it. Um, oh, that's yeah. where I was doing the research in that photo. I was doing research on American chestnuts in Kentucky. 
you know, there's only been like 3% of mushrooms that have been identified, I believe. I believe that was what it was. Yeah, the so, world of mushrooms is crazy. <laughs> yeah, this is really cool. Uh, Onesia Rosé Rose or something. Huh. Like a little person, right? Yeah. With a crown and fun pants. I loved that one. <laughs> what exactly is that? It's an orchid. Okay. Oh, they got more pictures here. Okay. Yeah. Orchids are so beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there are some crazy pollinator orchid relationships. There's the, um, do you guys know about the bee that uses the orchid flower oils as a perfume? No. no. A That's male, very interesting. Yeah, it's a male orchid bee, and it, it pollinates um, in the process of going and harvesting floral oils, and then it it wears this like orchid perfume that the orchid makes specifically like, I mean, a, they've adapted together so that the, um, that floral oil, uh, floral oil attracts the females like super well. So <laughs> it uses that as like a perfume to find a mate. Yeah. That's and then there's the, the orchids that will trick the bees um, into thinking that it's a female bee. Um, like the orchid itself looks like a female bee and then the orchid bee, the male will go and try to mate with the flower and oh. that's how it gets pollinated. <laughs> Look, the giant cicada. Now cicadas are all over the place now. This is a giant one. Look at the size of this sucker. Yeah, and it was beautiful. It's like holographic. Wow. I was like fangirling over that cicada. I don't like the watching. shells that they leave behind. They look like aliens. <laughs> I liked them when I was a kid. <laughs> and what is long waste? What is it? Long wasted honey wasps. What is that? That's interesting. That that was also Brazil. It's a social wasp that I found, and they they were super cute. They were tiny. Hmm. I'm I'm fascinated by this stuff. This is. Check out the crab spider. That was like one of my my prized um, observations. It's up on the right on the purple flower. I just passed it. What are you? Oh, right here. It's fine. It looks like a little stuffed animal. <laughs> it does. Oh, yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> it had like almost rosy cheeks. Like it was. Really <laughs> that's fine. And that's um. I think a blazing star that it's on looks kind of, or scorpion's tail esque. I don't know which plant that is, but but those um, usually those guys will blend in a lot better on the flowers, and they'll just sit there and wait for a pollinator, hunt it down. Did you see any weird like orchid praying mantises there? Oh no, not the orchid ones. I've seen a lot of praying mantises there. But not the those like beautiful orchid ones. Yeah, they're so they're so cool looking. So, do you like snakes? Or I do like snakes. Like... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not like, I'm not like super well versed in snakes, but I think they're cool. <laughs> and then there's a lot of underwater stuff because I I also dive. So. But I'm not like crazy well versed. How were you that. not terrified of diving? I'd be terrified. I was originally more scared. Um, that's a cordyceps fungus, actually. They just passed. That's really cool. Actually, I think it's a cordyceps. It's um, it's that family Ophiocord. Yeah, yeah, cordyceps. That one. So I took this photo and I was like, "This is a really cute little mushroom." Um, but then later I was zooming in on it. So I zoomed in on the photo and I, what I thought was a wood chip is actually um, a tiny little bug. And that mushroom, you know, parasitized that bug and grew out of it. So like, I don't know if you can get down to the base of it. Um, yeah, try doing that. That's as far as it goes. Oh no. Go all the way out. Can you see? Yeah. There okay. Isn't that wild? Yeah. Okay. So this is always like kind of my husband and I were thinking about. We're like, 
okay, so there's all these mushrooms that you could take cordyceps, right? And he's like, wait, isn't that the cordyceps that like go into the ant's brain and then they go into the colony and, you know, and, the, and like, I think so. Yeah, yeah. So, they're wild. There's a cicada one too. I think it's a cordyceps. That, so is the mushroom cordyceps that we are taking, is it doing the same thing? No, the the cordyceps <laughs> won't. <laughs> if there's that whole like, it's a wild idea. Are we gonna be zombies? No. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it is very good for you. It's wild though. Like I I had this cordyceps tea that um was like it it was like a cup of coffee with no caffeine. Like it jump started your day. Really, but it had not just the fruiting body of the mushroom, but it had the caterpillar, like, just like this photo. <laughs> so I was like, oh, you know, this is really good tea, but it kind of is weird that I'm making, like, tea out of a caterpillar. Like, <laughs> oh, it was kind of buggy. <laughs> um, it really tastes like dirt, but it wasn't bad. <laughs> but it, like, it really energized you so it's kind of you know it's worth it <laughs> wow so you've seen a lot of really cool interesting things i love this site it's so cool it's awesome yeah you guys should get on there <laughs> yeah and you've traveled yeah. to some really cool places to actually like for me like i don't go a whole lot of places i guess i could take pictures in my backyard but it yes, wouldn't be near as interesting as brazil or madagascar <laughs> so i mean uh, in my in my house in brazil i just i didn't have screens in the windows and i didn't have ac so the windows were open all the time and half the stuff that i documented in brazil was just stuff that flew into my house <laughs> and i had like I have little bug boxes that have a magnifying glass on top. Um, and so I just like everything that came into the house that I could get my hands on, I'd put it in the bug box and look at it. <laughs> that's <laughs> funny. I think that's so cool. Yeah, um, it's very low effort. <laughs> bug yeah. uh, tell us about this little guy. Um, I, I don't know much about um, like any details, but I just thought it was really cute. <laughs> hey, he is. Yeah, definitely. I'd be looking at like, who spray painted you? <laughs> <laughs> Another, hey, earth balls. <laughs> oh, I've never are, heard of these. Is this that is like a puff ball? Does it? it is. Yeah. It is. Yeah, I, I poked it a couple times. Did you really? <laughs> That's awesome. I'm just I like getting those in my yard. They're funny. I'm make sure my computer is charging one second. So, guys, that was just like page one. I mean, <laughs> and this is nothing. This is nothing, really. Oh, these little things like freak me out when they like this kind of stage when they're creepy and crawly like that. Yeah, I think they're funky. Like they're they're cute, they but they've also stung me. <laughs> oh, really? Well, oh. just like, they burn you. You know, if you touch them, and by accident, like. I was, oh my gosh, the worst one. I was walking through the mangroves carrying like a ton of field equipment. So there was no way to, I had no, you know, hands to brush anything off of me. So it fell from above. Oh. And it got caught on my arm and it just got like in between my arm and the equipment. And I had like all this stuff. So I couldn't, I couldn't get it quickly. And then it just, that time it lasted forever. But other times, it's when you, when you just brush up on them, it doesn't, it's not too bad. That was it like, almost looks like a turkey tail mushroom, but it's not. There's probably a turkey tail in there somewhere. There's definitely the false one, too. Is that chaga? That is termite. Is oh, termites. <laughs> it looks kind of like chaga. I never, wow, look at that. I never knew that. And fun fact termites are not actually ants, they're actually related to cockroaches. Really? Yeah. I learned that um, on that hike. <laughs> <laughs> Taking a photo of that. Yeah. There's so many mushrooms in here. This is great. I love it. 
this is something I really want to get into because um, nobody's really gone into it and we, yeah. we, we need to learn a lot more. It's funny that we see that frog there because lately here I've been really, really into the screaming frogs. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> I think they're so cool. I, I told my husband I want one. I think they're so cool. They're just probably the most interesting frog. Yeah, I love frogs. The first uh, time I liked frogs when they said, bud. Wise, er, <laughs> <that commercial. laughs> uh. I had frogs when I was in elementary school, and that was like my first, um, I don't know, biology obsession. I was like really into frogs as a kid, and then that I mean, I still are most frogs though in Brazil and in Madagascar and stuff are they poisonous? Um, no, no. no ones that I came across were poisonous. Oh, cool. I mean, there. I'm sure there are. There's, you know, poison dart frogs and things like that. But those are, the poison dart frogs are really tiny. So you kind of have to search for them, like under leaves and stuff. And I don't oh, know. okay. Yeah. So it's not like they're just out there. Like, they're not going to touch you if you are, you know, because I'd be worried that I'd be walking through and the one would jump on me. Like you did have that caterpillar jump on you. <laughs> Is there different types of prey mantis over the world? Like I know there's like Carolina prey mantis and like oh, there's Brazil. Yeah. yeah they, we were talking about the orchid one. You got to check out that one out because they're beautiful. It's like white and pink. Is it that one? They, yeah, they almost look oriental, like yeah. they belong to that section of the world or something. They're just absolutely stunning. Like, yeah, there are some really pretty, pretty yeah. houses. Usually the ones that would come into my house were either green or brown. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. you know, they're all really cool. There were, um, I noticed that some of them had like a lot more wings. Like some of them were really like flyers, like they would fly away from you and stuff and the and then others were had really small wings and didn't really use them much explain go back up uh joe explain the clear mushrooms here what are those uh which ones um the genus uh rory i can't i'm sorry it's so small i couldn't remember wormesis or something yeah um those, I, not a huge explanation i just thought they looked cool they're really tiny oh so, um when they get really tiny, like the white is kind of translucent, um, but that's that's why they're not like large and clear. They're just they're funky. <laughs> I was experimenting with taking um, photos of small things. I would love to get into macro photography, but I just yeah, don't I think that's super cool too. I love to take um, pictures of flowers in that mode i have a uh, macro on my phone yeah and so i love to do that and get real up close it's just i follow a lot of accounts on instagram that do macro and, and there's one um account that does it all on their phone i just think that would be really cool but i don't, I don't know how you do that could you eat this berry yes i did eat that berry <laughs> It looks so good. <laughs> okay, what did it taste it like? Was it like a raspberry or? It was kind of like a raspberry, but, but tart. Kind of like a raspberry and blackberry combo. Hmm. Yeah. It's a, I mean, I think there are bramble berries in the U.S. too, but I've never had them. You must have seen some uh, crazy looking spiders. Yeah. <laughs> The spiders do spiders pollinate too, but do they do it by accident? Um, not that I know of. I okay. don't think that if they do, it's not very significant. Yeah. But they play a good role in gardens um, as predators. Everything needs its like checks and balances. And yeah. I usually leave the um, spiders alone. I just I we have the banana spider here, mm -hmm. which. Is a, it's a basically an orb weaver. Yeah, we've heard those the there's I think orb weavers just in general, that whole selection of them is just super cool. Yeah. Um, and we have the one that's yellow mm -hmm. and it usually hangs out in the garden. Um, 
I had one in my house one time. I was like, we can't kill it. It has to go outside. Um, Cause they're just so cool. And yeah. we always get like the Halloween ones that are really weird looking right around October. And um, they're just, they're just super fascinating. I could look at them forever. And they always make the most, the coolest webs. Yeah. So what do you think of a Chinese lantern fly? A Chinese lantern fly? It's know. it's not here. You don't have it here. It's 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 an invasive. It's very invasive. Where you know, for us, it's more or less. It's I guess it was started in China, went to Philadelphia. Okay, and yeah. It's spread all over the Northeast. I guess actually. we don't have it down here. Lucky. Yeah. Probably not yet. Not familiar with it, yeah. Um, I I've never seen them here, but supposedly they are here. I oh, just yeah. we, we haven't seen them yet. I've seen polka. I had to click on this. <laughs> <laughs> this is cool. I love this. I, yeah, I this is a really cool it. site. Um, I definitely want to do this. I always take pictures of my flowers and stuff like that. So and sometimes we call them bio blitzes. Um, it's like a project will will be opened for a specific period of time, and it's like. Okay, now we're just gonna do, I don't know, spiders. And it's like everyone get in as many spiders as you can for one month, and then you can see like everything. Um, but sometimes, like we've had in at my um, college and things like that, I've set them up myself. We've had competitions, and you know, it ranks you. So it'll have like the the person with the most observations, and then. Um, the most number of species because you can observe more than um, you can observe one species more than one time, which is also good. Like, you know, you don't, if you've done it before, it's also good to do it again because like I said, the whole research part of iNaturalist, you're going to add um, more locations where that species is. And so if someone's monitoring it, then that's awesome. But yeah, so you can set up bio blitzes and have people join them and be like, okay, Let's say for one week, we're going to do butterflies and whoever wins, um, I don't know, we get something special or, or like if you're doing it between friends, then you can <laughs> set up something like whoever wins will buy us around or something. <laughs> <laughs> That's always good. <laughs> winner, winner, chicken dinner. <laughs> um, when you're on these trips, do you stay in the woods too and camp or is like there a spot it, yeah. that um on this one I didn't. Um this was actually a trip with my fiance's family. And so I was just along for the ride and everything was scheduled um by them. But usually when I go on a trip, I um I like to camp like I've done um West Virginia and Colorado, um and Oregon, and that was all camping. It's a lot of fun. Aww. That's I a lemur. It. Yeah. Um, and they're pollinators. Oh, really? I didn't know that. That's the world's largest uh, pollinator. Now, how do they pollinate? Just by eating the fruit? Um, No. So they actually drink nectar and they pollinate a really specific. Um, so, you know, they're like iconic Madagascar animals, right? And then the iconic Madagascar tree, or one of them, because there's also the baobabs, but one of them is the traveler's palm. Um, and we have, I mean, a lot of landscapers use them here in Florida, so you may have actually seen them before, but, um, they have these really hard calyxes like around their flowers. Um, and only the lemurs can break them open to get to the nectar and, uh, the pollen inside. And then it's made so that the lemur has to like really get in there to get, um, <laughs> the nectar and in the process it just gets pollen everywhere and goes to the next one yeah that's that really tail. neat I that tail is amazing yeah it's awesome that is so long see i would i would have named every single time i seen an animal i would have started naming them like hey that's simply yeah. jane he, Look looks at like, he looks like a ted <laughs> he yeah. looks like a ted. <laughs> that's good <Ted>. the lemur <laughs> <laughs> and here's billy <laughs> <laughs> the Wickershire. 
<laughs> like, I, wow. So I those mean, actually might be poisonous, but I saw them in a terrarium and I took a photo. So that one's cheating. <laughs> Same with the crocodiles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Nile crocodiles freak me out. Yeah. They're, really, they're really weird looking. Yeah. Yeah, that was a weird experience. I actually went to a crocodile farm. <laughs> it was, wow. tons of those. They, what, Gatorlands in Florida? I went there when I was a kid. Well, but in Madagascar, they eat them. It's like going to um, to see, like, cattle at a cattle ranch. Oh, no thanks. I'm yeah. good. <laughs> Goody suckers. It was a cultural experience. <laughs> did you? Okay, I know you're a vegetarian, but did you try it? I did. You did? Was yeah. it good? No, or was it too fishy? No, it's not fishy at all. It tastes no? like chicken. Oh, <laughs> that's what they always say, though. <laughs> Yeah, it's actually not bad at all. Oh, that's cool. I'm, I'm kind of proud of you for doing that. That's really cool. That's out of your area and you just... <laughs> <I'm not laughs> that's when, cool. When in Madagascar. <laughs> that's awesome. Oh, look at this lady beetle. <laughs> so I didn't know if you keep on clicking on it and get closer. There you go. Yeah, I didn't know that either. Now I know. <laughs> it's a lady beetle? Is that what you said it was? Yes. Is yeah. that... A lady bird beetle, like, is it a ladybug? Just well, yeah, animal? it's like the group. Um, lady beetles is kind of like a, a way of referring to the group, like a common name for the group of ladybugs. And and oh, that's cool. Yeah. Wow. Oh, look at this one. I mean, oh my god, there's just like so many new things I have never seen before. I hope you guys like this. <laughs> I, I, Look at this guy. I have a weird thing with that. Looks like a what is that? Is that That's a crab. It's a crab. It's made to um, mimic the sargassum seaweed, and it oh. looks just like it. Like when you see it on the seaweed, you you don't see it. <laughs> it's, wow, it's crazy. Yeah. That's yeah, I could talk about bugs all night because I that's something I really like to talk about. Um. But yeah, like, I, what, this is just really, this is beyond That's what I thought we were going to be talking about this evening. This is awesome. <laughs> so there's a crazy scene over there with that wasp. Oh, that scary. Uh, that looks like the Asian wasp. Oh, that looks dead. Um, so, or the European, I mean. <laughs> what is this called? What was this one called? That's just a paper wasp. Paper wasp? Yeah, but it was really big. There was a nest just right outside my window, and I never got stung or anything. They were super chill. I would just watch really? the thing. Yeah, <laughs> and they that's were... usually something that they they're not though. That's cool. Yeah, I mean, I think like we were neighbors. They knew who I was, and so <laughs> just kept to our own. It was fine. Yeah. Oh, a boa! Let me click on that one. Yeah, that was cool. <laughs> Just on the side of the road. I was literally on the on the road. Yeah, that's and massive, huge. Yeah, it's weird because its tail looks completely different from the rest of its body. Yeah, I think it had just eaten because oh. its body is like super thick, and then its tail is. Yeah. That what did, what does your family think about you getting into the, this kind of stuff and going away and seeing nature? Oh, they think it's cool. I mean, when I went to Brazil, I was with my family there. I actually lived on my grandma's property. Um, and she's been in the forest there since the 80s. And um, yeah, so like my dad was living, was my neighbor. My aunt was my neighbor. My grandma was my neighbor. So it was like a family compound <laughs> in the middle of the do, forest. Do you speak Portuguese then? I do, yeah. Awesome. Oi. <laughs> that's as much as I know that's as much as I know Oy. Um. well what is this one oh this is a, just a carpenter ant it's an ant yeah. yeah I never really look close up Whoop. those guys every time it rained they were taking shelter in my living room <laughs> oh. oh here we go like, as long as you stay out of their way, it's all good. Yeah, those are super cool. And those are really pretty. 
They, ha they have like lacy wings. <laughs> well, I guess you like the warm weather. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't mind the cold. <laughs> at this point, I've been in the warm weather for so long. I feel like in like 60 degree weather, I would be freezing. <laughs> Honey loss. Wow. I love that you can click on this and get really close. And that's a precar precarious nest. They build them on the palm fronds and like sways in the wind and everything. And oh, wow. It, yeah. Like, I don't know, you're investing in a palm frond that can fall at any moment. But <laughs> that's a really cool fungus that I just stumbled upon. But the thing with the, the fungus is, you know, you get it to a certain point and a lot of times it's hard to identify it further. So like it's fungi, including lichens, it's really general, but um, there's just so many and at this point. And like in the world of fungi, I feel like it's constantly changing with um, like species being changed. Oh no, this one's actually not related to that one. And it's related to this one. Oh, this is actually a different species. And they can take so many different forms and like one species can reproduce in like three different ways or something like that. Oh. <laughs> Not the size of a New York rat. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a tiny little mouse, actually. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <Like this> big. <laughs> oh. Yeah, that one wasn't doing too hot. <laughs> Walking. In. This is now we're getting real far back. I was walking a class. Taking that one. <laughs> well, it's, that's really cool. I hope you guys go check that out. I mean, that's a really, really cool website. Yeah. You can and have fun and then you're also doing a lot of good at the same time. It's a win-win. <laughs> let's talk about butterflies a little bit. Sure. You know, the monarchs, because the monarch, minor, monarchs are so important. What are some of the key factors to determine a butterfly's habitat preference? Um, well, you mean like uh, what they prefer to forage? Yes. Yep. So they, they tend to go for tubular flowers, um, deep nectar sources. Um, but that doesn't necessarily like look like a tubular flower always to us. So, you know, an aster, a sunflower, or something like that is actually built up of Ton, like a ton of teeny tiny flowers in the center and mm -hmm. it's not one flower it's a compound flower and each of those is a tubular flower with a fairly deep nectar source so you know you've seen i'm sure butterflies on um black-eyed susans echinacea things like that because those are actually um tubular um but usually they don't have much of a preference for scent they don't have much of a preference for um, nectar guides, which is the patterning on the flowers. Bees really like nectar guides, <clears throat> but they really like bright colors. So orange and red, um, pink, purple, um, which is really interesting because bees can't see reds. So when you see a tubular flower that's also bright red, it's not only meant, um, or it's not only adapted to attract butterflies and maybe hummingbirds, but it's also kind of adapted away from attracting bees. Oh. It's not even producing a color that they can see. They're totally colorblind to red. So yeah, um, tubular, bright red, orange. They usually like a landing pad, um, something to land on. Um, because also they, they taste with their feet, like I mentioned before. So they, they use, when they land, they use their feet to find their nectar sources too. Oh, wow. Okay. And can you explain the life, si life, life cycle of a butterfly? Yeah. Yeah. So um, they start as caterpillars and there's not necessarily a specific season for that they usually reproduce you know spring and summer more likely um but every species 
you know, it's, you can't really say that for everyone, usually not in the winter, but it depends on where you are at the same time, you know, down here, um, that does happen or in Brazil, Brazil, that does happen. But, um, yeah, so they start as a caterpillar. They, um, eat their host plant, um, as a caterpillar it doesn't necessarily have to be a plant that they're going to use in their adult stage. Hmm. Um, monarchs you know they eat milkweed as caterpillars they also will visit milkweed for nectar but they'll also visit a ton of other nectar sources they're not limited to milkweed after that larval stage but during that larval stage they can only eat milkweed so like just as an example they have different needs depending on what phase of life that they're in hmm. and so they will create their chrysalis um which is uh, also where they differentiate from moths somewhat. So the chrysalis is actually part of their body. So they, when they create their chrysalis, they build, they create this like hard exterior, but that is part of their body. They're not building it with any other materials. And a moth will typically create a cocoon with silk and sometimes use sticks or leaves or other materials in that process whereas a butterfly uses its own cells. And then that process is wild, where they just totally like break down <laughs> and then re, um, like their cells will come back together and create their adult structure. Um, so that like can last um, depends on the species, but a monarch, I'm pretty sure, is about um, a week to two weeks, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it might be less than that. But um, then they emerge, and in their adult phase, they feed primarily on nectar, or they feed only on nectar. They essentially have like a straw for a mouth, whereas in their larval phase, they feed only on plant tissue. Um, and then that's when they're, you know, doing all their pollinating. Yeah. So what are the biggest threats to the butterfly uh, populations glo globally? Um, really similar to like the general pollinator threats, habitat loss, pesticide use, um, climate change, depending on the species. But um, habitat loss and pesticide use are the main like hard hitters. Yeah. And As how does... How does climate change interfere with that, if their migration and breeding patterns? Oh, um, well, so it depends on, you know, their migration. There aren't a ton of migratory butterflies that I've looked into other than like I've gone deep diving into the monarchs. Um, monarch migrations are triggered by changes in light. So the day length. So it's not triggered by temperature or by flower forage availability. Um, but, you know, it, changes in temperature could affect those seasonal changes in their life stages. So like environmental cues could change if they um, react to cues like changes in temperature. Or um, and, you know, another big thing with climate change is extreme weather. So... Um, not necessarily temperature related, but I mean, overall, yes. But um, things like extreme weather events, hurricanes, um, fires, things like that can really impact not just butterflies in general. And I know monarchs have taken um, a couple of hits from like the wildfires and things like that, especially when they're migrating and, you know, hurricanes in the Gulf of Mexico area, things yeah. like that they're making their way across that's really difficult um and hurricane season is kind of overlapping with their fall migration so that's difficult so how do we protect them then um well the best thing that you can do is create habitat um so a big thing for if we're talking monarchs migratory butterflies they're traveling long distances they're using a lot of energy and if they don't have the habitat available for them to like refuel and rest, then they're not going to make it. So wow. they're flying across this, the whole continent. They can fly, you know, 3000 miles in their migration. And that's 
one individual. They're they're really wild, actually. This is a tangent, but their um, fall migratory population or generation will live around nine months, whereas their spring and summer generations live just a few weeks, which is super wild. Um, but so that nine month, um, the one that lives nine months is the one that does the full migration either to Mexico or if you're talking Western population, they go to California and then back up north before um, laying eggs for the next generation. But what you can do for them is really just have nectar sources and milkweed available because that's what, that's what they need to refuel. They're going to you know, drink the nectar for sugar, for energy, to keep going, to keep flying. But um, they also need to reproduce to, you know, the, well, their biggest issue is population decline. And so what we can do for them to help them um, increase populations is provide the milkweed uh, for their caterpillars. And oh. so, yeah, so as they're moving up, they're going to be laying eggs, but they need, they need milkweed, right? So if there's no milkweed, there's nothing to lay eggs on, they're not going to reproduce, they're not going to be able to bring in the next generations. So that's like the the key part, um, or like if there's any key plant in their life, it's the milkweed. But um, when they're traveling long distances, if that milkweed isn't flowering, then it's not gonna serve the adults in the way that they need. Um, it's gonna serve the larval population, but you're gonna want some flowers too so that you can provide energy for the adults to keep going. Okay, so if we people are just starting a garden. We want butterflies. How do you, how would you tell them to get started to start a habitat to start a to start a butterfly garden? Like, what what's the first thing they should do? Yeah, um, I would say to plant, um, like I said, flowers that are more up the butterfly's alley. So. Tubular, red, orange, purples, yellows. They also like yellows, pinks. Um, and it's important also to have, you know, flowers that um, flower at different seasons. So you're kind of covering all your bases for the, the populations that show up at different times in the year. Um, and then if you want specific butterflies, you can look in more into uh, like larval host plants. Um, but then it gets like, you know, it gets more specific. Um, like I said, oaks are really good larval hosts for Lepidoptera, which is butterflies and moths. Um, but a lot of, a lot of plants that you'll, um, find like native flowers are also larval hosts off the top of my head. Um, I know like at least in the South. Um, frog fruit as a ground cover is really great. Um, it's a larval host for a lot of butterflies. You can always plant milkweed. Milkweed is great. No matter where you are, there's going to be monarchs at some point in the year. You know, if you're in North America, that is, and um, just not Northern Canada. <laughs> but as if you're not in Northern Canada, if you're in North America, you can cater to the monarchs. Um, they tend to like also herbs, like... Um, yeah, someone said dill, um, mint, things like that are popular among butterflies. Um, yeah, and like down here, um, passion vine is popular for um, native butterflies. Mm. Um, yeah, and so also I think if you're interested in like really in-depth guides you should check out the Xerces Society site um, that's the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation it's X-E-R-E-S uh, wait no I, I'm not good at spelling out loud one sec <laughs> X-E-R-C-E-S there we go um, and they have like infinite pamphlets so you can go in there and select your region and then select what kind of pollinator that you'd like to garden for. And they've got plant recommendations 
out the wazoo. They've got so much information. Oh, wow, um, that's awesome. Yeah, but yeah, because I mean, it's hard to say like, oh, just Google it, because I mean, uh, so many things will come up and then you've got to sift through all that information. But if you want a plant list, the Xerces Society is super, super reliable for that kind of thing. So if anybody has any questions, just make sure they're all in caps so we can see them. And you guys could ask away. And look at this. We have the best mods ever. <laughs> Boom, just like that. <laughs> Amazing how fat, how many uh yeah, something they deliver just like that. <laughs> Thank you, Jay and Jane. We appreciate you so much. Jane, it was amazing. <laughs> Yeah, it was gonna uh, simply Jan said she had tons of butterflies this year. Oh, awesome! It's great. It's great to hear that. Yeah. So, what's the craziest thing you have ever seen in the uh, wilderness? Oh wow, it's a tough question. <laughs> As we say, boom! <laughs> it's channel. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> the craziest thing I've ever seen. Why is that so difficult to think of? Like off the top of my head, I'm sure I've seen some crazy stuff. <laughs> this is just kind of funny, um, but one time I was hiking and a fish fell out of the sky. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> but I wasn't like on the shore or anything. And it was like, it was a large fish. Like it could have knocked you out or something. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I think it was um, swallowtail kites that were flying around and no way. kind of aggressive and fight over their food and it just fell. So I'm like hiking and this fish just falls. It lands right next to me. Okay. So it, the fish didn't fly. A bird brought it over. It. And yeah. I looked it up and the birds were like, they were large birds. And the, the fish was a large fish and they looked super tiny. So that thing was falling from way up high and it was like heavy. <laughs> so it was like dangerous. <laughs> Oh. No, I, was thinking, I was thinking Sharknado could be true for a second. <laughs> Imagine that. You're walking and all you see is shark. Oh, no. <laughs> I have seen a flying fish, though. Those are also pretty wild. Yeah. <laughs> well, they say those carp in the Mississippi are pretty wild. And they just jump right in your boat. Those are seriously dangerous. People, like, go out with helmets now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> it's, it's, on a boat. It's sad asking. though. They need to. I don't know what they're gonna do. It's a huge, yeah. huge issue. But yeah. huh. <laughs> see, in New Jersey, the only thing we have to protect ourselves of is snookies. Okay. <laughs> I'm not gonna see any more of that. <laughs> it's a Jersey Shore kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, LP has a question: What projects are on the horizon and in the future? For me, mm -hmm. um, well, I've. I'm working on, I'm still in the planning phase, but I'm going to be building a, a raised bed garden and I'm looking forward to that. Um, and I'm trying to document, document the process as much as I can. Um, cause I want to put together like a step-by-step, -step, um, I, I want it to be accessible for everyone. So I'm not going to focus as much on specific plant species, but more on like checking certain boxes and then um, trying to like build a guide for people to be able to make it work for different regions and things like that. Um, but to a guide to pollinator gardening that I can make available. Um, and then, yeah, I don't know um, exactly where this will take me like super long term but short term i'd like to put together um resources for people and ideally um host kind of courses i don't know if i'll be online or in person or or what and then um a project that i haven't started on at all but that i would love to do is write a children's book 
about this kind of thing because I feel like that's super important. I have a three-year-old brother and I've gotten him really into bugs and stuff over that's the so past cool. year and a half. And that's been really rewarding. He, when I first um, moved to Brazil, because he lives in Brazil, um, when I first moved to Brazil, he was like terrified of every bug that he ever saw. <laughs> now he will like, not anymore, <laughs> he would like come find me and be like, Leah, Leah, little spider, little beetle, like come here. And, then, and like every single bug he sees now, he brings me over and he wants to look at it. He doesn't want to hold them yet, but um, he wants me to hold them and he wants to get up close and like get to know them. So I think that's super cool. And I feel like that's really important for future generations. So. Uh, what do you most look forward to growing? To growing? Um... I mean, not necessarily what I look forward to growing, but what I look forward to seeing is um, native bees. But because here I'm, I'm in an area that's really developed, and I've been kind of like sitting around outside and not, not seeing much. Um, so it'll be interesting to see like how much I can bring in. And I feel like it's a really good test for urban areas because um, there's not a lot of grass or like, you know, not a lot of vegetation where I am. And so I feel like I'm doing raised beds because I don't even have dirt. Um, so it'll be really interesting to see like how much I can bring in. And I'm really looking forward to doing pollinator hotels. Oh, cool. So, yeah. So I'm going to try to document everything and I mean, follow me on iNaturalist because it'll be on there too, <laughs> new species and things like that. But I'm just really looking forward to seeing, um, I'm, I mean, I'm going to grow native plants, um, you know, tropical sage and um, lantana, the um, Florida button sage and um, privets and things like that. But I'm really most looking forward to seeing who comes and visits and then I'll be able to document, you know, and, and kind of have the story of what's doing well and all that. So, okay. yeah. So we've been having around 50 people in the chat. There's 30 people on YouTube. Then we got people on Twitter. We got people on LinkedIn and some other avenues. So thank you, everyone, for coming today. Just wanted to get that out there. Yeah. I, so this is pretty cool. A lot of people have been watching our show after, so you're going to be um, going to be out there. So this is awesome. Is this your first interview by any chance? This is the biggest thing I've done. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I, I love following people with a passion. And you definitely have a passion for what you're doing and going about. And, you know, it's always about doing the extra. Yeah. You know, like we talk about people doing soil for the last all these years, people only went so far. And I now just downloaded iNatural. Oh, yay! <laughs> <laughs> that site is really, really cool. I, I love it. You know, let's yeah. talk about your Facebook page, too. <laughs> I didn't, didn't let me show your Facebook page the Pollinator Power Network. Well, let me just get away. There we go. Do you guys see that on your side by any chance? Yep. Okay. So. Um, yeah, and I have an email list. Um, it's kind of like a little more in depth than the social media stuff that I do where I kind of focus on one topic for a month. So right now I'm focusing on um, adaptations that are like um, evolutionary adaptations that attract um pollinators and so like more just like the story of you know why does a plant look like this and why does this pollinator like it and then what can I what color and what shape and what scent should I plant for certain pollinators so then I'll I'll dive into things like that more in depth if you want um I tend to be a little wordy my emails get a little long but they're good. 
<laughs> and like last month I did all monarch stuff. Um, and then I'll, I send out a little poll every month and have people vote on the theme. So I do, I do have that. <laughs> cool. The link okay. is in my Facebook. Let's hear what you say here. Let's play this live. Butterflies are really sensitive to heavy metal pollution. So scientists have monitored their populations as a indicator of cadmium and copper pollution in certain areas. Hi everyone, today we're talking about indicator species. An indicator species is a species or group of species whose presence or absence tells you something about that ecosystem that it lives in. So this is typically something about the health of the ecosystem, like the level of pollution or degradation or fragmentation of the habitat. So tying this into the topic of pollinators, um, presence or absence of pollinators in an ecosystem can tell you quite a bit about it. For example, an ecosystem that has very few pollinators is probably one that has more habitat fragmentation, pesticide pollution, um, lack of foraging resources, and a habitat that has more pollinators or especially more diverse pollinator species is likely to be a healthier habitat than the other. But there you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's a little series that I started. I'm calling it Eco uh, Ecology Encyclopedia. And I'm going over different like ecological concepts or terms and then trying to bring that into pollinator ecology. But it's got kind of a general ecology um, focus too, where I, I just kind of break things down because I feel like it's, it's important um, to, to make that like more accessible because a lot of times science communications will sound like a different language. <laughs> I so, really want to make that accessible. So. I like what you said here. American yeah. elderberries are a wonderful addition to a pollinator garden. I have tons. I have about 30 elderberry bushes. I love elderberries. And they're also great because they like wet feet. So, you know, maybe not all your plants are going to want to live in that. If you have a corner of your yard, that's like a little more wet. Um, but the elderberry will love it. So, and they're also great for like, um, like I guess hedge planting or you know like a, a native version of like a privacy planting because they grow. You know that's something that some people think is a negative, but if you use it to your advantage, they grow um, like through their roots. The, the root system they'll grow like a a stand of elderberry. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, some people say, oh, I don't want elderberries because they spread. Um, but they spread in that like dense, like stand of individuals kind of way. And if you want privacy um, and you want native landscaping, then that's a good option. Okay, let's see what you have to say on right here. Did you know that caterpillars transfer more energy from plants to other animals than any other herbivore? Not only are their adult stages super important pollinators, but their larval stages are a critical link in our food webs. Yeah, everything likes to eat caterpillars. So that's another thing, like, don't be sad if a bird is eating your pollinators because that bird, you know, needs its place too and and it's like that same kind of thing with the soil or plants like you're building a foundation and you're like unfortunately since it's like a little living being you're providing food to the next thing on the food chain right and and so having a lot of pollinators is good for not just um plants and pollinators but the next next up on the food chain that's going to eat those pollinators yeah this is a crazy fact. There's 11,000 species of moths in the United States alone. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Did you know there are around seven? Wow. Look at that, guys. I never knew there were so many uh, species of butterflies. Yeah. There's way more moths. <laughs> we think so much about the butterflies, but the moths go under the radar. Yeah. Totally <laughs> under the radar. Yeah, for sure. Okay. What's, about, what's this about? 
species, and it acts kind of like a poster child for conservation in a certain area. So the example I'm going to use today is monarch butterflies as a flagship species for pollinator conservation in North America. Monarch butterflies are super well known and they have a huge geographic range. Most people will recognize a monarch butterfly and feel some connection to them because they've probably seen them before. And then the conservation efforts for monarch butterflies or any flagship species impact more than just that species. So when you promote the conservation of a flagship species, you're also benefiting all of these other species that cohabitate with them, and maybe they're not so easily recognized by the public, or they have really small geographical ranges. Other flagship species include polar bears, pandas, tigers, sea turtles, uh, manatees, bald eagles, and many more. So go check out the Pollinator Power Network and you'll find a lot more information and it's an easy way to contact uh, Leah. So let me stop sharing this. Yeah. That was awesome. Let me see if there's any other questions that I missed because I didn't see that page. Okay, hold on. Here we go. LPS question. If you could convince the world to do one thing differently, what would it be? Um, I think, I think thinking, um, ecologically, like ecological thinking, um, which I can I'll go into is a game changer. So ecological thinking is like, it's like a whole other approach to, um, I don't know, our normal, I think our way of thinking is really linear and, you know, you do this thing, you get this thing, you get the output. And then there's like, if you approach things with like an ecological thinking standpoint, you're looking at things more cyclically. You're looking at, um, you know, how one thing connects to another and how um, relationships and, and um, interactions are not purely competitive or, um, you know, neutral. And there's so much interaction and benefit and community and so like I feel like if we interacted as humans in more of a, a network and um, like cyclical mindset kind of way we would have a lot more um, we would be a lot more conscious of like where our waste goes or um, how we're you know helping one another and not just like in our each in our own bubbles, doing our own things in our linear ways. <laughs> yeah. So Jay Dixon just uh, said a thing for you. It goes, please consider making your valuable contributions to more different social networks so people can see what's going on, you know, what you're teaching and, and everything. I'm open to, um, to recommendations. I'm not quite sure what different social networks um but yeah <laughs> um let me see if there's any other questions no other questions um cork you have any other questions i not at this time <laughs> <laughs> i like putting people on the spot <laughs> um so it's two hours and uh want to say thank you so much for coming on. But we do have a Serena joke. Maybe you'll like a Serena joke. Serena, time for your joke. <laughs> Jason, Serena's our joke of the day. So let's see what Serena has to say with her joke. Last live, I forgot. So I got to make sure I get it up before. She, um, I told you I want to save my joke. You know, whatever. <laughs> okay, Serena, I'm waiting for you. Um, yeah, is there anything else would you want to uh, say about pollinators? Um, that we didn't go over. <laughs> I can't really think of anything off the top of my head that we didn't go over. I feel like we covered quite a bit. Um, but like, if anyone has questions, feel free to reach out. I'm you know, pretty easy to contact. And, um, you know, I could, can I, do I have access to the chat? I could put my email in there. Yes. yes. Um, oh, there we go. Join the chat. Okay. 
Oh, it's on YouTube. Okay, wait a second. <laughs> This is interesting on this site because there's a lot of parks and stuff that are on this site. So that's kind of cool. So you guys need to sign up for the iNaturalist network. Yeah, the iNaturalist, like there's a lot of organizations that use it. Yeah, you can get involved with a lot of stuff on there. Okay, there's an email. Oh wait, it failed to send. <laughs> I'm not quite sure. Um, but it's Leah yeah. my, my, at pollinatorpowernetwork.com. So if anyone wants to note that down. <laughs> I'm not quite sure why my comment didn't go in. Um, but this is my first time using this streaming service and so I guess it's pretty stream yard's pretty cool. It's very easy to use. You can share a lot of things and uh, we have a lot of success with it. Okay. Jay Dixon from Serena, which insects rule an insect king kingdom? Monarch butterflies. <laughs> That's a Serena joke. <laughs> All right, guys. So thank you everyone for coming to tonight's live. Hopefully, hopefully you guys all learned a lot. And go check out those sites and hook up with uh, Leah and uh, ask questions away. We're all here to help as much as you can. Yeah, I uh, love oh, Jay goes, uh, could you say that email slowly so yeah. she could keep it up? Um, wait, actually, I have an idea. I'm going to write it down and I'll hold it in front of the screen. And you guys take a picture. <laughs> Because it's kind of a mouthful. I'm going to write it nice and big. So for everybody on his site, um, we we have memberships on his site. They start at $2.99 a month, um, which is not much. And that all helps us out tremendously. Um, we have the six contests, and we only have to the end of the month to register. Some of those contests, you can win $100. Well, all the contests, you can win $100. Um, second and third place prize will get 2,025 seeds from MI Gardener Mary's Heirloom Seeds. That's crazy thinking that 2025 already. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there's some great prizes there. Some contests, not many people have entered. So make sure you go into that. Okay, here it is, guys. Is it backwards? No, it's not. Okay. Nope, that's perfect right there. Great. Hopefully that works. <laughs> Sorry, just, hold, there. just hold it up there for 10 more seconds. All right. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you for having me. This is great. Yeah, thank you for coming on. This is very interesting uh, talk. Jane. <laughs> Jane Doe. And Serena, for some reason, we, we don't get it on our end, so it, it doesn't show up on our end. I have no idea. But, but actually, it. it's, yeah, Pollinator Power Network. Yeah, I was missing the power in that first one. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, there we go, Jay. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for having me. This was wonderful. Yeah, this was a lot of fun. And uh, so everybody in the chat, just hold on for one second, Leah. And... Uh, Everybody else, we'll see you guys on Thursday. Oh, so, hi. all right. Take care, everyone. Everybody have a good night. God bless.